Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Learning with Washington University. This is Module 5, Classification and Regression. Part 1, Binary Classification. We will start by We will start by running the feature and vector encoding functions that are at the top of every one of these modules. You always want to make sure that you have run those. We'll see more detail about this when we get to the preprocessing module. We are going to look also at three different visualizations. We'll see the confusion matrix, which is useful for classification neural networks, the rock chart, which is useful for just binary classification, networks, or you can apply it to multi, um, more than binary, but you're going to have multiple rock charts, and the lift uh, chart, which is good for regression neural networks. We'll see more of these later, but for now I'm just going to run them so that you get a chance to see what these look like before I explain their internals. So we'll start with binary classification. Binary classification. For this, we're going to use the UCI Wisconsin uh, breast cancer data, data set. If you click this link, it'll take you to my information file for this, this data set. This is a data set that comes from the UCI machine learning repository. This is the original site for it. UCI, if you've not seen them before, is a very good site that contains a lot of data that you can use for various machine learning prediction problems. Here I, I took the data and I added headers to it just to make it a little bit easier to load into pandas. But other than that, all the data sets that I have on my uh, website are pretty much the same thing as the UCI ones that I pulled them from. This is all of the columns. So essentially you have an ID, which is just the ID of that particular row. Not useful. We'll drop it and the diagnosis, B for benign, M for malignant. This determines if you don't have cancer or if you do have cancer, zero or one. The mean, radius, and all these others, these are just measurements from individual tumors that allow the deep learning algorithm to learn if, it's, if they have cancer or not. The output, or the, the, the first 10 rows of this data set, look like this. It does go a ways to the right, and that is, those are all of, the, all of the columns. We're going to create a neural network that classifies between benign, which will be 0, and malignant, which will be 1. This is the CSV. We're pulling it from the data directory, so it's available with the class website. The class website version, like I said, just has the headers. We're going to drop the ID column, and we're going to encode text numeric the diagnosis. That changes all those Bs to zeros and malignant to, uh, malignant to one. We do track the number of classes that we have. This will just be two. We split into X and Y so that we have the diagnosis. And we also split into a training and test set. We will build a sequential network. Uh, first hidden row, hidden layer will have 20. Of course, there's the input before that, and then 10. And then finally, it's going to have a shape equal to um, Y, which is going to be just one. You typically have just one output neuron on a, on a binary classification neural network, and then we measure the accuracy. So let's go ahead and run this. It should do pretty good on the accuracy. It's a relatively simple data set, but it will demonstrate a binary data set. Okay, the accuracy is right around 96, 97%. Let's generate a confusion matrix for that. that this is the first of those charts above that I provided you with the code for. We'll run it here. There's the confusion matrix, both in, in several forms. Let's look at the chart first, or the graphic. 
a good confusion matrix should have a very strong pronounced diagonal. These two should be nearly white, which they are. They're not perfectly white. They are somewhat tinted blue. But this means that the, you see the true label and the predicted label. This means that it predicted benign and it was benign. This one here means that it predicted malignant and it was malignant. So this lets you know which classes are difficult for it to differentiate between one class or the other class. These are the actual numbers. So we see that there are 88 cases where it truly did choose the, the benign correctly. And there's 50 cases where it shows uh, malignant. These are not weighted. Um, these are not weighted evenly. Fortunately, for the patients anyway, there are more benign cases than are, there are malignant. So you do have unbalanced data. And we'll, we'll see that there's cases where we have to do spe specific things for that. The ROC chart that we will see in a moment is very good for dealing with unbalanced data. And then this is just a normalization. It's saying that 99% and 93%. These are rounded, so you don't necessarily um, expect them to add to, to 1.0. Exactly. And you see the normalized confusion matrix here. They look really pretty similar. I usually prefer looking at the normalized. And these are all the predictions, just output into the pred. All right, now we're going to look at ROC charts or rock charts. Rock charts are typically only used for classification, evaluation, and they're usually only used when you are dealing with binary classification. If you're dealing with more than just two classes, then you end up dividing everything into sort of a one versus rest, it's usually called. So if you had three classes, you would break that into three classification problems of class A versus the rest. So maybe class A versus class B and uh, C. Then class B is the next group versus A and C together, and so on. So you would end up with multiple charts, one for each of those one versus rest entities. Let's look just at how to create one ROC chart. And we're going to create it for the Wisconsin uh, breast cancer. Now I've got all this information here that you can read when you're going through the course module. I'm not going to literally read all of the text. That's, that's how these classes are set up. But you have to be aware of false positives and false negatives, as well as true positives and true negatives. So these are four different ways that you can classify something in a binary, uh, in a binary classification. False positive, that just means that you, you were wrong. You, your neural network was wrong. It said that it was positive or it said that they had cancer, but they really did not. A false negative is where the neural network says that they don't have cancer, but in fact they really do. True positive, true negative, those are good. That simply means that um, it was positive. For true positive, it means that it was positive and the neural network correctly classified it as positive. True negative means it was in fact negative and the neural network correctly classified it as negative. When you deal with statistics, you will often talk about different types of, um, of error. Type 1, type 2, sensitivity, specificity. So if you're dealing with the um, true versus the false positives, that's a type one error or a sensitivity, the sensitivity of the test. Type two error means you're dealing with true versus false negatives, and that's the specificity of the test. So what, you're, what this is all about is you're trying to establish some sort of a threshold where if, because the neural network is going to return a number probably between zero and one. So one would mean it's very sure that it's positive, that they have cancer. 
Uh, zero on the other side would mean it's very sure that they, that they don't. You need to pick a cutoff. And that cutoff, or threshold as it's called, is essentially where you decide that, okay, anything above that threshold is true. They, they have the disease. You might put it all the way at 0.9. If you put it at 0.9, then anything above it is going to say that you're um, that you are that you do have the the issue. So most of the cases are going to come out false. That is a better sensitive test. If you make it really high over here, the the, the handful of cases that do come up higher than 0.9. Those are going to be cases where the neural network is really, really sure that they're positive. And those will be true positives. All of your, but you're also going to then have a lot of false negatives because you've created this huge area. Often you'll just set it at 0 0.5. Uh, that's the somewhat uncreative way of doing that. And anything above 0 0.5 is true, they have the disease. Anything below is zero or false that they, they, they don't. But you want to look at, there's a variety of charts like this on, on the internet. You are looking at basically the true positives versus the true negatives. So here we have this normal distribution is all of the true positives. This normal distribution here is all of the true negatives. Anything that is in this area is truly a positive. You know that from your validation data. Anything here is truly a negative. You know that from your validation data as well. You need to set the cutoff somewhere. So if we set the cutoff right here and something is just barely above the cutoff, it is going to classify it as a positive. But you can see there is still some area here of the, of the, of the negatives where it's going to generate a false positive then because anything above this is going to be um, true. So we're saying true or positive in this little range here but that's going to be a that's going to be a false um, a false positive. The false negatives will occur over there. So as you adjust this, you get better um, you get better sensitivity or better uh, better specificity or better sensitivity. It's all a question of would you rather have what's worse, false negatives or false positives? You can, you can eliminate one versus the other by simply swinging completely to, to one side. If, you, um, if, if one is really more important than the, than the other. So this is a more sensitive cutoff. We are cutting it very, very close to, the, um, to zero. So the neural network all of the ones here, these are the, these are the true negatives. And if you see the, the, the distribution for the, the true positives, it's so small here, they almost don't occur. They really don't, you don't start seeing positives until you, until you get to here. But everything over here is going to be considered a positive. So you're going to have false negatives all in this area. That's what you are doing to get a really good true negative rate. So ROC charts are basically two axes. You are looking at the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And as you go across, these are all different threshold settings. So if your threshold is set down here, you're going to have very few true positives, but you're going to potentially have a whole lot of, um, you're going to have very few false positives, but you're going to potentially have a very large number of true positives. So if you look at how to evaluate one of these, 
this line right here essentially is a worthless model. It's not, it's not really predicting anything. A, a coin toss could do the same. As your model gets better and better, you get more and more um, area. Basically, a really, really good model pulls this all the way up here as close as it can. Because overall, what you're evaluating is something called area under the curve. So if you look at the area under the curve of this line, it is 0 0.5. So that's not a very good AUC. This would be a larger AUC, and this would be merely a 1.0 AUC, which would be very good, but also probably overfit. We can plot an ROC chart for that West Can Wisconsin Breast Cancer data set. And you can see it is doing very well. It's, it's, it's at 97%, so it's it's doing quite well. You, you, you really do not have too much area that is not area under the curve. Okay, this is the end of part one. In the next part, we're going to look at multi-class classification.